Welcome to Season 3 of the Climate Conscious Podcast. I'm your host, Deval Bazi, bringing awareness to climate change and sustainable development from a Caribbean perspective. Connecting you to sustainability solutions as we move from awareness to action. Today's guest was born and raised in Guyana before moving to New York City in 2008. She holds a master's degree in environmental policy and sustainability management. Her studies focused on climate justice and sustainability in Guyana and the Caribbean. In New York City, she worked as an educator at the Climate Museum and the Green Girls Program on the City Parks Foundation. In 2018, she decided to move back to Guyana to follow her dreams of doing environmental work in her country. Currently, she is the Senior Environmental Officer at the Environmental Protection Agency. She is the founder of the Breadfruit Collective, an emerging NGO which aims to work at the intersection of gender and environmental justice. She is also a Climate Reality Project Fellow. I am excited to welcome to the Climate Conscious Podcast, Ms. Christine Samwaru. Hi, Christine. Hi, Vival. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to speak with you. We've been meaning to do this. I'm so happy that we are finally able to have you on the Climate Conscious. Yeah, same here. I think we're starting off the year, right? (laughs) So you and I met last year while we were both being trained as climate reality leaders. And then working with the rest of climate leaders from the Caribbean region, we hosted our first webinar that focused on the impact of the climate crisis being experienced in the Caribbean. These impacts include sea level rise, drought, flooding, extreme weather events, sargassum seaweed invasion, just to name a few. But in many cases, women and girls are more vulnerable to the economic, environmental, and social impacts of climate change and find it more difficult to recover. Often, this type of impact is not at the forefront of the climate change conversation. So how would you describe the connection between women and the climate crisis? For me, when I think of the climate crisis and sustainability and anything related to the environment, I always think of women. Initially, I don't think I was viewing the environment in that way. But as I learned more about climate change and the climate crisis that we're all facing right now, which is the most um, important issue of our time, I realized that women, they're vulnerable. They're one of the vulnerable groups. They're also the ones who are in the field doing the agricultural work. So when climate change hits and we have droughts and extreme flooding, they're impacted. Also, I realized that the climate crisis and climate impacts, that's another stressor for women. So every day, women are already faced with various challenges. And now we're adding climate change to that and climate effects. So it's just like we're the burden, it's extremely heavy for women. And I know for Caribbean women, we know that in many cases, they are There are instances where there are a lot of single parent households. So you're thinking of women having having to be the head of family. And also in the Caribbean, we're also seeing a lot of climate change impacts. We're seeing it right before our eyes with hurricanes. And after that, you also have to think about rebuilding. In the Caribbean, we're very small countries, small islands, and we don't have the resources to build back as quickly as other places. And so if you're a woman living in the Caribbean, now you're you're the head of your household, but now you are faced with this hurricane. How are you building back yourself? You know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of issues that intersect with climate change and intersect with women because we know that if we're taking women, we're taking their point of views. Um, and perspectives into our projects and development, we know that that project is gonna be as high as seven times better. And however, if we continue 
uh, if we continue to like leave women behind, we know that it's just gonna that's the rolling, I guess, the rolling ball, you can say, added to climate change because we're not going to find a solution. So it's not that men are not experiencing climate impacts, but that women and men have a different experience from the same encounter. Exactly. And the, right. And the ability to bounce back or to recover is a challenge, particularly for women and girls. Yes, correct. And I also wanted to mention that if we're we're in the process of, you know, the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, and we're hoping to create this new world, basically, whereby we're tackling all the issues from poverty to climate change. And I just like to highlight goal number five, which is gender equality. And if you read in that, um, the target set out under that goal, like women, it's their their voices must be heard and must be included, women and girls, when we're making these changes, these um like climate, if we're take, talking about climate change, their point of view needs to come across as clearly. And as organizations and as donor agency, what we're seeing now, like they are asking for, there is a gender component to a lot of um, grants and so forth, which is very, very good because it allows um, people who are doing these projects to think outside of the box and realize that women, we need their voices, we need their perspectives. And the issues faced by women, it's like a long time coming, you know, in terms of if we're talking about gender-based violence. And on the Breadford Collective, I do talk a lot about gender-based violence. And the reason why it's because gender-based violence, especially in the Caribbean and more so in Guyana, that's an issue that it, it's been happening for years. And I think because it's so common and so widespread, we've gotten to a point where we are numb. We're so used to it. We're so used to domestic violence that it's not a surprise anymore. And specifically in Guyana, what I can say is one in every two women experience some form of gender-based violence in their lives. So even though we know it's happening, we're not doing anything or we're not doing more. I would say we need to do more to address the issue. That's a very um, startling statistic in terms of one in two women experiencing gender-based violence. And I think that is an issue that um, needs particular attention throughout the Caribbean because we also have our own issues here in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. And you highlighted that climate change becomes an additional stress for women. So on top of existing social or economic issues, when you add this environmental issue, it basically compounds the vulnerability of women. There was a study that said, you know, the biology of women can make us more susceptible to increased stress. For example, heat stress, water stress, food insecurity, and vector-borne diseases. And therefore, the strategies that we come up with need to be tailored to these unique challenges. Yes, correct. And like you said, the biology of our makeup, um, women are the majority of the world's poor. And as you mentioned, when a disaster strikes, they're actually the ones um, last to, to leave. Uh, and I'm thinking that's because like maybe they're the head of their homes, you know, they, they have to make sure everyone is okay before they can actually leave. And it also was shown that disasters such as hurricanes and any kind of um, climate related act, um, events, women are likely to be killed compared to men. So the threats and pressures on the environment and it's the resources that we do have is am amplifying these gender inequality. And it's showing you clearly the power imbalances. Because when we have less, there is more stress in our communities, in our family. And usually uh, at the end of that, women are facing if it's, you know, they have to prepare for their homes, they have to take care of their families. But if they don't have a job or right now we have the pandemic, um, how how are they, you know, how are they going to be able to do, do those things? The issue of loss of livelihood is a, a critical issue. We're seeing, especially now with the pandemic, where women have to choose between their livelihood and also their responsibility as um, caretakers for their children. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. What I was going to say is with the pandemic, so we're um, we're a few months away from it being one year. What, what we find in Guyana, and I've been reading also internationally, so the recorded, um, you know, to call in and report domestic violence, it's been five times more, more so than a regular year, um, if you're comparing it. And then there's also some cases whereby now that women are inside with their husband, in some cases, their abuser, they're also afraid. They're afraid to report anything. And in Guyana, even though we're one in two women experiencing domestic violence, what we see is 50% of women in Guyana would never report these incidents to the police because they honestly, they don't trust them. And I've heard stories whereby the police uh, reports back to the husband and then the woman, she she just gets an additional, um, you know, a beat down from her husband, so to speak. So, Christine, you have highlighted some of the specific challenges that women and girls face. What are some practical solutions to these challenges? I would say definitely realizing the connection, if we're talking about climate change, realizing the connection and intersectionality of gender-based violence and gender equality. So if we're promoting the environment, it can also link to safe and sustainable future for women if we take into consideration the special circumstances that they face. I think it's really important for us, especially in the Caribbean, and we can trace it back. You know, we, my four parents are indentured servants. Um, some of the ancestors of Guyana, they came from Africa. There's a lot of generational trauma that, that don't get addressed. Um, in our families and in our society. There's a lot of pain um, that's being carried around and we see the the pain of these uh, unaddressed issues in in forming other ways. It's coming out in different ways. And one way is through domestic violence. So I think as a society, and I can speak from my, my experience in Guyana, what I would say is we really need to shift the way we think about women in our society, because there's a there's a gender gap, a huge gender gap between men and women. And if we're trying to develop our society, we really have to create spaces whereby they feel safe. They feel safe enough that they can report this incident and they can have justice. Um, they also need to be paid, you know, paid equally. So if you know, they're not able to provide for themselves. A lot of times they would, the easy thing would be for them to just stay in an abusive relationship because they have to take care of their kids. And I would say providing more outlets whereby maybe shelters or just housing and work for women because we need to engage our women if we want to develop our society. They Women makes up half of our society. So if we're in a country that's killing our women, one in every two, um, we're losing. We're losing so much wisdom, knowledge, experience, and all of that that can help us develop and create this country that we want to see um, as we are a part of this 2030 agenda So I think it's really important for us to think about the kind of training law enforcement need to take if we're addressing domestic and gender-based violence. We need more NGOs and more resources to fund programs. And as Guyana, we're in a transition right now. So what I can say, I really hope that the new administration, like they take these things into consideration. So, Christine, let's say one of our decision makers is listening to this podcast and they're questioning or they're not as convinced of the Mm -hmm. importance of gender equality and its relevance to our sustainable development. What would you say to them? I think I would start off by saying um, the population, if you look at your population, there is 50 percent of it. Um, It's made up of women. So you really need their perspective if you're thinking about projects and so forth. Because if you're developing a project and you're not taking into consideration women, your project is actually going to suffer. And if we're thinking about women and the kind of benefits that we can have, it shows that if we're promoting gender equality, that's also um, promoting the environment positively. And that can be linked to creating a safe, 
a secure and a sustainable future. And if you ask any person right now, especially leaders um, under the UN, the various conventions, they are working to address that or they should be working to address those 2030 goals. So if we're talking about projects, whatever it is, if we're um, not convinced that women and their voices aren't as important, we are not being progressive. We're not um, thinking ahead of the future. So I, I think it comes with, when, when I talk about women and the issues they face, it's also like a moral, a moral issue. And you really have to sit down and try to understand um, your society and your country. Because like I mentioned before, the generational trauma that we all, especially in the Caribbean, uh, and we don't really address it, you know, we, we're we filled with so much pain because our ancestors, they went through um, traumatic experiences. And we are the generation that's trying to build the future and we're trying to make it better and we're trying to unlearn and learn new patterns. So I think if we, we are talking about gender equality and taking it into consideration, we're being a progressive, we're being a just leader. So you founded the Breadfruit Collective, which is an emerging NGO in Guyana. And you founded this based on the belief that we cannot have a functioning society until it forms a healthy, positive relationship with its women and girls, as well as with the environment. Could you share with us the role that the Breadfruit Collective will play in solving some of these challenges? So I, I started the Breadfruit Collective during the pandemic in July of 2020. So it's a very new organization. Goal when I started and the goal right now that I have is for it to be a safe space for women um, to feel feel comfortable sharing their stories or sharing anything, maybe a, a piece of art or something that relates to um, the everyday life of being a woman. So it's that safe space. And also, um, when I first started the page, what motivated me to start, it was because every other day I was seeing in a newspaper various articles about women being killed. So the page is there to also commemorate and remember these women whose life we're taking um, because of their uh, partner. It could have been avoided. Gender-based violence is 100% avoidable. So it's important for us to not forget about them, to remember them, to say their names. And I want my organization to always remember them because we're doing this work to eliminate this type of violence. One thing we also need, especially in Guyana, we need counselors, we need psychologists. I think if we're a country that's developing for the future, we need to have that those things to address the trauma that we carry. And also, I want the, the organization to bridge that gap between gender and the environment, because in Guyana right now, we're doing a lot of development because of our oil resources. And I want, if we're talking about the environment, I want them to talk about women and the role that women play in these projects. And similarly, if we're talking about um, women, I want them to also talk about the environment that women live in. So it shouldn't be a separate issue. It should be an issue in both aspects where one and the other is being addressed. Uh, I also think that the Breadfruit Collective, what I wanted to act as a place whereby it's offering generational healing. And I would like to work and to continue working with women of all ages because we know girls, they also, they're vulnerable groups. So I want women who are, you know, old, older, uh, middle age, young girls. I want the various perspective because women experience various form of violence throughout their lives. What stands out to me is when you said that gender and environment should not be separate issues. And from doing some research, they have shown that there's a correlation between gender inequality and environmental degradation. We see that link between the exploitation of the environment and the exploitation of women. Can you share any of your observations regarding this correlation? Yes, definitely. So there is a field of thought, um, the eco-feminist perspective, whereby there's a deep connection between um, witnessing the exploitation of the natural world, of the natural environment, 
directly tying to the oppression of women. Because when we think about the environment and we think about nature, we always refer to it as mother nature. So there is a, uh, a lot of studies being done that correlates, correlates sorry, the connection between women, the way we treat our women, and the, ex- the deploitation of our environment and of our natural world. And this is all stemming from a capitalist, um, money-driven um, society. So are there any initiatives in the Caribbean to address this issue? Yes, so I am happy to share that there is there is the Spotlight Initiative, and this is something that's been led by CARICOM, and specifically they're in countries such as Grenada, Guyana, Trinidad, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago, because those countries, those five countries, they unfortunately, they have extremely high gender-based violence rates. So all of them, um, so Grenada, Guyana, Trinidad, Grenada, Trinidad, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago, they are actually, so one in three, one in every three women experience gender-based violence in their lifetime. So that number, it's in line with the national average or like the global average. Unfortunately, Guyana stands out because we're actually leading the rates, unfortunately, on gender-based violence in the Caribbean. Okay, wow. Well, we definitely need a lot more emphasis and attention being placed towards both gender violence and environmental degradation here in the Caribbean, particularly as we are so vulnerable to environmental impacts. So I'm happy to know that there's a CARICOM initiative to address this issue. Definitely, I am. Similar to you, I'm excited that there is, you know, an initiative that's coming from CARICOM to address this issue uh, at a regional and national level. And I hope to see positive changes. Yes, and coming back to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we see where, as you mentioned earlier, Goal number five is gender equality. And therefore, this is critical for the region's sustainable development. Yes. So this is what I love about sustainability. You know, it's so complex and so exciting. There's so many areas to explore. So therefore, we need everyone on board. Everyone has something to contribute to sustainability. I like to think that everyone is a sustainability officer. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) Yeah, it's about building resilience in our society. And we can't have that if if one segment of the society is disadvantaged or disenfranchised. Yes, exactly. 100%. The environmental issue, I like to say that that's the issue of our generation because we're already seeing the impacts of climate change. It's not something we're thinking about in the future. And we're the last generation to do something about it. So whatever career path we are choosing... We are whatever how our lifestyle is, we have to adapt to a change in climate and we have to think about sustainability and we have to think about solutions to climate change. And, you know, when we're thinking of the Caribbean specifically, unfortunately, we are so small and so vulnerable to climate change impacts. We have to prepare, you know, prepare for the worst, I should say, because this is an issue that's so complex and it requires it requires um, cooperation between all sectors, I would say. And we know that climate change affects everyone, but the effects is not equal. The effects of it doesn't, um, it's not everybody is going to be affected in the same way. Vulnerable groups such as youths and women and indigenous persons, they're always going to be the most affected, the most vulnerable. And definitely we should take their perspective in any projects or programs that we're developing. (laughs) I certainly agree with you, Christine. In my opinion, women intrinsically know how to be resource efficient and socially inclusive and therefore are ideally positioned to, to champion sustainability. But we cannot do it alone. We need all stakeholders on board. We need our men working together to seek solutions for sustainability and resilience. So, Christine, where can listeners connect with you and the Breadfruit Collective? So, um, I have a page on Instagram at the Breadfruit Collective. 
And I always welcome persons to share stories to reach out if they're comfortable, no pressure. If they, they want to share a piece of art or just their thoughts on gender and the environment or one or the other. I'm all, always willing to um, engage in conversation. And as I mentioned before, the Redford Collective is a very new organization, but I'm hoping to grow. So I appreciate all the support that I've been given so far. And yeah, if listeners want to engage with me, um, they can find my page at the Breadfruit Collective. I just want to say thank you so much. And I'm so glad that we met last year. And since then, I appreciate you so much because you're always thinking um, of ways to assist. And what I would say um, to people listening out there, just there is the pandemic, but I welcome everyone to take care of themselves and put themselves for first. And also think about the women in your life. And maybe um, if you haven't seen somebody, just call them and make sure that they're doing okay. Because as I mentioned, women, we face so many different challenges. And now we have a pandemic. And in various situations, a woman, uh, we don't know what she's dealing with. But what I would say is just check in on the women in your lives. (laughs) Thank you, Christine, for enlightening us on the intersection of gender and environment. And I look forward to hearing more of what you're doing with the Breadfruit Collective in Guyana and in the wider Caribbean. Thank you so much. And I look forward to many more episodes of the Climate Conscious Podcast. And you're doing incredible things. So thank you so much for all your efforts. Thank you for listening to the Climate Conscious Podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe and connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Climate Conscious. And be sure to check out The Climate Conscious Lifestyle Kit. Maybe like me, you've tried to become more sustainable in the past, but found it expensive, inconvenient, inaccessible, or just ineffective. The Climate Conscious Kit takes the frustration away from your eco-friendly journey. We bring you our inaugural collection of quality, affordable, low-waste, plastic-free versions of items we regularly use. Join the Climate Conscious community in the sustainability transition. Actively reducing our carbon footprint, avoiding single-use plastics, and diverting waste from our landfill. Pre-order your kit today.